Now, there are things about nature that you know for sure. Or don't you? Let's check how much you know about the incredible world we live in. How many of the 14 points will you guess? Let us know! The Great Pyramid of Giza was built when mammoths still roamed the Earth. Myth or fact? It's actually a fact. The most famous pyramid in the world had been constructed about 500 years before woolly mammoths went extinct, approximately 4,000 years ago. Their last known habitat was the cold and deserted Wrangell Island in the Arctic Sea, which might not have been as cold then as it is today. There are more trees on Earth than stars in the Milky Way. Is it myth or fact? It's a fact! Scientists used to believe there were about 4 billion trees on our planet, but more recent studies have shown that there are over 3 trillion of them, making it 420 trees per person. As for the stars in our galaxy, there are only about 100 billion, which is 30 times fewer than the trees on Earth alone. The trees you see are all individual ones, myth or fact. This is false. In fact, 90% of the trees on Earth are interconnected by mycelium filaments. They send warning signals when in danger and exchange nutrients through them. It's kind of like the underground internet. Also, there are organisms like Pando, for example, which is the largest single living being on the planet. It looks like a dense forest of quaking aspens. In fact, it's basically a single giant tree, with its roots being interconnected underground. We drink the same water dinosaurs used to drink hundreds of millions of years ago. Myth or fact? Actually, it is! Only a small portion of the water on our planet has evaporated for good. The rest of it is constantly renewed. So, mammoths, dinosaurs, and whatever came before them billions of years ago drank and swam in the same water we see today. Not to mention what else they did in the water. Unfortunately, the water doesn't keep information about those ancient creatures for us to find out more about them. Lightning never strikes the same place twice. Are you willing to bet on that? Myth or fact? If you aren't, good for you. Lightning may strike the very same spot as many times as it wants. It might seem random, but the electrical discharge from the sky is pulled toward the tallest objects in the thunderstorm area. Also, the material this object is made of matters too. It's by no chance that lightning rods on buildings are mostly made of copper and aluminum alloys. These metals are some of the most conductive materials, so they pull lightning very efficiently. All deserts are hot. Now this one's easy, right? Myth or fact? If you guess it's a myth, then right you are. Deserts are qualified not for their temperature, but for the presence or absence of growth and life in them. The most well-known desert is the Sahara, of course, and it is indeed very hot. The actual largest desert in the world is Antarctica, which is almost twice the size of the Sahara Desert. And you wouldn't call it even lukewarm. It's a polar desert, and there are several others on our planet. For example, Greenland. There's enough gold underground to cover the entire planet in a thick layer. Would you believe that? Well, you should, because it's true. Since 1950, humanity has mined nearly 200,000 tons of gold. If we made a cube out of all this metal, it would be 70 feet high and wide. Recent data from scientists confirm that there are huge reserves of gold in the Earth's core. The metal is enough to cover the whole planet, and people might have gold up to their knees. The problem is, we just can't mine it from there. Hey, I don't mine if you don't. The Moon and Mars are better mapped than the Earth's oceans. Now, this can't be true, can it?
Actually, it can. We have a detailed map of the Moon and Mars, although we're still discovering surprises on their surfaces granted. Still, over 80% of the Earth's oceans are unmapped and unexplored. We can't study the oceans properly because of pressure, cold, and lack of light underneath billions of tons of water. The lava is always red. What other color can it be, right? Myth or fact? Myth. Usually lava is really red or orange because it's basically molten rock from the deep bowels of our planet. But there's one volcano in Indonesia whose lava is blue and luminescent. Only at night, though. During the day, it looks normal. No mystery about it, just tons of sulfuric gas. This volcano also has the largest acidic crater lake in the world. The water there is so turquoise, you want to jump in immediately, but you probably guessed you should never do that. The fire on that volcano is also blue, the largest blue fire in the world, rising up to 16 feet high. Ever seen a gas stove burning? Here, the principle is basically the same. You can see a rainbow at night, too. Is it myth or a fact? It's true. And there's even a name for this phenomenon, a moonbow. Also called a lunar rainbow, this event occurs extremely rarely. It's similar to a regular rainbow, except when it appears on a clear moony night after a rain shower. There's a thing called a fire rainbow, myth or fact. You bet! It's a beautiful phenomenon when the clouds in the sky are painted all the colors of the rainbow, looking like a fiery, multicolored cascade. It only occurs when the conditions are right, and those are very specific. It's close to the equator, the weather is clear, there are feather-like clouds in the sky, the sun is higher than 58 degrees above the horizon. Such clouds are made of ice crystals. When the sun's rays hit them, the particles refract the light and create a rainbow. Wow! There are rainbow trees. Myth or fact? If I made you doubt this, I'm glad, because this one is not photoshopped. This is the rainbow eucalyptus, and their bark may literally have all the rainbow colors. These eucalyptuses shed their bark at different times each year. Every time the old section goes off, the tree first reveals bright green bark that was hiding underneath. And then it may turn any color. There's a whole set of hues. Orange, maroon, blue, even purple. Stones can move on their own. Myth or fact? Well, you'd be right to believe me. There's a desert plain in California where rocks move around of their own will. Once this plain used to be the bottom of a lake, but then it dried out and became an arid wasteland. Sometimes, rains fall here, flooding the entire valley. When night comes, the temperature drops and the water is covered with a thin layer of ice. When it gets warmer again, the ice breaks into segments and the wind pushes them around the place. Some of these ice shards take small rocks with them. When the ice melts for good and the water evaporates, the only thing that remains are trails left by the rocks, as if they'd moved on their own. Mud puddles can move around. Myth or fact? In fact, a single mud puddle in the world also travels as it wants, and nobody still knows why. It moves at a pace of about 20 feet per year, and it seems to have started its journey near the San Andreas Fault in California. People have tried to stop its march, but couldn't. So far, this creeping natural disaster isn't showing any signs of stopping on its own, either. So, there's your pesky, problematic puddle to ponder. Are humans the only creatures on Earth that enjoy eating spicy food? Probably. I mean, it's not like you've ever seen a giraffe ordering a curry takeout at your local restaurant. Well, that might not be completely true. 
It turns out that tree shrews, these adorable little critters, have a burning passion for spicy food too. Asian researchers stumbled upon this fascinating fact. Tree shrews are the only non-human mammals who intentionally seek out mouth-numbing, tongue-tingling, tear-inducing spicy delicacies. Scientists detected a sneaky genetic mutation in these courageous tree shrews. They feature a certain receptor that is responsible for detecting pain caused by the scorching sensation of capsaicin, the infamous hot chemical found in chili peppers. It's like having a secret superpower that shields them from feeling as much discomfort as the rest of us mere mortals. But how did scientists come to this astonishing revelation? They decided to venture into the wild and looked at five wild tree shrews and a group of six wild mice acting as the control group for the test. The team then took notes on how each of these tiny mammals reacted to the fiery capsaicin. No surprises when it came to the mice, they really didn't have a good time. But the tree shrews remained remarkably calm and collected. The secret behind the tree shrews' spice resilience was a single amino acid that sets them apart from their mouse counterparts. While many plants have evolved to deter animals from munching on them by producing pungent chemicals, the tree shrews have managed to outsmart Mother Nature. The scientists behind this study believe that the genetic mutation responsible for the shrew's spice tolerance is an incredible evolutionary adaptation. It allowed them to expand their culinary horizons and survive in diverse environments. For us humans though, spices aren't a modern discovery. Even back in prehistoric Denmark, our ancestors had a spicy side. Researchers found some ancient pots that were used for cooking around 6,000 years ago. And guess what? They found traces of a peppery, mustard-like flavor. Now, when exactly did humans start seasoning their food? That's a bit of a mystery. Take coriander seeds, for instance, which are heavily featured in many Asian, Middle Eastern, and Mediterranean dishes. They were found at a site in Asia, dating back a whopping 23,000 years. Unfortunately, we can't be absolutely sure if they were indeed used to add flavor to food. They might have been just growing there randomly. However, solid evidence has been uncovered that confirms people in Northern Europe were intentionally spicing up their food around 6,100 years ago. This is the earliest known record of spiced food in Europe and possibly the world. To get this spicy scoop, the researchers examined the leftovers stuck inside 74 cooking pots from ancient sites in Denmark and Germany. These pots had all the chemical signatures of meat or fish, and they even found phytoliths, which are little mineral traces left by food. These phytoliths were similar to the ones found in garlic mustard seeds, a local plant known for its zesty kick, but not much nutritional value. Here's where it gets interesting. There were way more phytoliths in the pot residue than in the surrounding sediment. That means those clever people intentionally brought the garlic mustard from elsewhere and tossed it into the pots. What's even more amazing is that these pots predate the arrival of agriculture in the region. So we're talking about good old hunter-gatherers here. Now, let's ponder this spicy conundrum. Why are humans so obsessed with adding a kick to their cuisine? We've got a couple of theories brewing. One is that even the Neanderthals used plants for their medicinal properties, and the garlic mustard seems to have been used as a disinfectant back in the day. So maybe our ancestors had a knack for combining flavor and health benefits. Another idea suggests that humans started seasoning their food because some spices have antimicrobial properties that protect against food spoilage. In other words, our taste buds might have evolved to love the spice for a good reason. It kept us safe. Others prefer to keep things simple and believe there might not be a functional reason behind our love for spice. It may all come down to the joy of taste. Next time you add a dash of chili to your meal, Remember that you're continuing a tradition that goes back thousands of years. 
Have you ever wondered why spicy food feels like it's setting your taste buds on fire? It's because spicy food contains that mischievous little compound called capsaicin. When you take a bite of that fiery dish, capsaicin latches onto the specific receptors inside your mouth. Now, these receptors weren't initially meant to detect capsaicin at all. They evolved to sense heat, acting like the mouth's own heat detectors, keeping us from munching on foods that could cause harm. But here's the funny part. Capsaicin and VR1 receptors ended up in this relationship by accident. When capsaicin waltzes into the picture and triggers those VR1 receptors, our brain gets a signal that shouts, HOT ALERT! And that's why we perceive spicy food as hot, even though, technically, it doesn't have a high temperature. It's just our brains being tricked into thinking we're eating something that could burn us. Although spicy food doesn't actually burn, our brain falls for the trick and believes we're in some sort of discomfort. So why do we keep going back for more? Scientists have been scratching their heads over this curious phenomenon and uncovered a fascinating explanation tied to our brain's pain relief system. You see, when our brains think we're hurt, it releases endorphins for us to get better as soon as possible. These endorphins not only dull the bad sensation, but also shower us with a nice feeling. It's no wonder we adore spicy food. The spicy saga goes even further. Scientists have been delving into capsaicin's potential beyond the realm of taste buds. They've been exploring its abilities to provide relief and have stumbled upon some intriguing findings. Throughout history and across various cultures, Capsaicin has been used to tackle an array of ailments. From fever to different types of aches, capsaicin has made its mark. In certain communities in Peru, they burn leaves containing capsaicin to produce steam, which helps alleviate headaches. In the Dominican Republic, these leaves are ingested as a form of treatment. And in the Philippines, capsaicin-rich fruits are sought after to treat people's joints. Now, you might assume that the spiciness of peppers, for instance, is a clear message from Mother Nature screaming, Don't eat me, silly human! That's exactly what scientists initially believed. They thought that pepper plants evolved their fiery flavors to keep us mammals from gobbling up their fruits. However, recent research on wild peppers suggests that deterring big mammals like us is actually just a side gig. The real reason behind their heat is likely their way of defending against much smaller threats. Nasty insects and pesky mold. Back in the 1890s, scientists proposed the direct deterrent hypothesis to explain why peppers evolved to be spicy. According to this theory, peppers wanted to make sure their fruits were feasted upon by birds, not by clumsy creatures like us. You see, Birds' heat-sensing nerves are blissfully immune to capsaicin's fiery charms, making them the perfect seed dispersers. The direct deterrent hypothesis took a hit when scientists looked at the natural variation in pepper spiciness. It turns out that the heat levels of pepper species tend to vary, probably because producing capsaicin isn't easy. So if these peppers can get away with being mild, they stop producing the spicy stuff altogether. When scientists ventured into pepper-packed landscapes where both mild and hot peppers grow, they made an intriguing discovery. Mammals, even when faced with milder peppers, don't really fancy eating them. Also, peppers don't crank up the spice levels just because there are more animals around. It's like they're saying, hey mammals, you're not the main concern here. Instead, the spiciness of peppers seems to be closely tied to the local climate. Spicier peppers tend to thrive in areas with more rainfall. Why? Because of fungal damage. That's right, fungi wreak havoc on our beloved peppers. It turns out that mold, not mammals, might be the true reason behind spiciness. Now, can you honestly tell me you have never used your phone while driving? I know, me too. But we both know that it can be dangerous. To help with this, some newer cars have a special feature called a heads-up display. 
This option shows important driving information in front of you, like speed and directions, so you don't have to look away from the road. It's like a floating screen on the road in front of you. This can help you drive safer and avoid getting a ticket for going too fast. Not all cars are so modern, so to drive safely, you need to put your phone away. Thankfully, some cars have special places for your phone while you're focused on the road. One specific 2021 model, Chrysler Pacifica, has a feature where the second row of seats can be folded down into the floor. It's good for carrying big items. But when the seats are up, these areas are good for storing things out of sight. Just remember to check and clean them out every once in a while, because they can become magnets for all sorts of knickknacks, like french fries or wet swimsuits that will surely start to smell at one point. Keep some cleaning supplies in your car, just in case. Are you a science fiction fan? I have some good news for you then. Turns out that flying cars may be closer to us than we think. And it's not just because they look cool. Manufacturers are looking into developing such vehicles for practical reasons, too. For starters, our standard roads are getting pretty congested as time goes by. We'll need some other means of transportation in the future to be able to cope with a large number of vehicles. You can find loads of flying car concepts online for all preferences. There's one that looks like a giant drone, and another one like a mini airplane. The simplest designs just took a car and put wings on it. Some cars will light up a snowflake on the dashboard every now and then. In case you're wondering, it's a sensor, and a pretty important one too. It shows the exterior ambient temperature. It gets activated when there's a road warning due to a sharp drop in temperature. It may sometimes even come with an audio warning or a message on your dashboard to inform you that the roads may be getting icy, so you can either adapt the speed or change to the appropriate tires if necessary. Cars these days aren't just adapted for the cold season. They come with cool features to help out during the summer months, too. I'm talking about those neat sun visors. Check your car to see if it has this added bonus feature. We know they twist to help the driver out even when they're not driving directly toward sunlight. Some visors can also extend, so they can provide shade to a larger area. If yours can't extend, there's a simple solution. Buy a sun visor extender. You can even find them online. They work by being attached to your existing sun visors or the windows for better shade coverage and visibility. Now, your car might have another hidden feature. Well, it's technically not in the car, but in its tires. These days, some cars come equipped with foam-filled tires. They were created to fix the problem of air-filled ones that often went flat. Why? Well, because foam-filled tires have many of the same benefits as air-filled tires without the danger of leaks. Regular air-filled tires can sometimes lose air over time, even if there hasn't been any damage. In most cars with this feature, the tires are not completely filled with either foam or air. They have a mix of both. A bonus of these modern tires is that they make the cars quieter. Generally, electric cars make less noise, but because of that foam, they end up being as quiet as a cat. Some people like the fact that they're quiet, while others prefer that classic screeching or rumbling that vehicles make. But even people who like the sound of regular engines might like the quietness of these new models because they are still very fast. Hey, I drive one, and it's fun! You might have stumbled upon a button called AEB. It stands for Automatic Emergency Braking, and it's a feature that uses sensors to detect if a collision is going to happen really soon. When activated, it will automatically apply the brakes to try and prevent something bad from happening, or make it less severe. There are two types of AEB, one that only works at slow speeds and one that works at all speeds. If the car can't be stopped completely, the AEB system will try to slow it down as much as possible to reduce the impact. Many cars now have systems that can warn you if someone is walking in front of you and can even automatically stop the vehicle to prevent an accident. These systems use special sensors that can also detect bicycles and animals. 
However, a study found that these systems don't always work well, especially at night. Even if your car comes equipped with this added feature, it's crucial to always pay attention while driving and not rely solely on these systems. A little thing called Lane Centering Assist helps you stay in the middle of your lane when you're driving on the highway. It's not a replacement for paying attention to the road either, but it can help guide you through gentle curves. You'll still be in control of the car and can turn the wheel if you want to go in a different direction. Some systems give you a lot of feedback, while others are more subtle. Lane Centering Assist can't handle sharp turns, and in most cars doesn't work if you don't have the cruise control on. What's also cool about this feature is that if it senses you've removed your hands from the wheel, it'll give you the warning to return to the correct driving position. A lot of accidents can happen when you're reversing your car, like out of the supermarket parking lot. Parking sensors can help prevent these things from happening by using radar or sound to detect things that the driver might not see from his position. These sensors will make a noise or show a warning on the car screen to let the driver know something is there, like another car or a person passing by. If you're planning to have a road trip, you know how hard it is to adapt to various speed limits throughout the country. Traffic sign recognition is a technology that can help with that. It allows you to know what the speed limit is on the road you're driving on. It uses a camera to take pictures of traffic signs and display them on a screen in your car. This can be helpful if the signs are hard to see or if you miss them while driving. Some cars with this technology can even change their speed automatically based on the signs they see. This technology is mostly found in luxury cars, but it is becoming more common in other types of cars too. The AAA Foundation for Traffic Safety has made studies that show up to 6,000 drivers per year have bad accidents simply because they were too tired. Sure, I would like my car to come with built-in coffee makers or showers to keep me awake on those long days driving, but some do have systems that can tell when a driver is getting kind of snoozy. These systems monitor the movements you make while in the driver's seat. It looks at things like how you turn the steering wheel around and move the car. If it senses you're a bit too tired to move on, it'll make a noise and show a message on the dashboard urging you to take a break. Some of these systems even show a picture of a coffee cup to remind you to stop at the next gas station for a refreshing beverage. Might save your life, too. So hi! How about exploring some cool and unusual artifacts from the past? Let's go! Have you ever heard of Chinese magic mirrors? These mirrors were made of solid bronze. They had two sides. The front was a shiny polished surface, similar to our typical mirrors. It was the back that did the magic. When bright light fell on the mirror, it looked as if it was transparent, and the pattern on the back of the mirror got projected onto the wall. The backside could have different designs on it, depending on what its creator wanted to depict. Since the mirror was made out of bronze, no one expected this optical illusion to occur. These ancient artifacts date back to 2900 to 2000 BCE. They became popular in China and were produced in large numbers at the time. Eventually, their fame faded away. For centuries, the magic of these mirrors baffled both people and scientists. In the 11th century, Chinese scientist Shen Ku decided to study the mirrors. He conveniently had three of them. He was surprised by the ability of the metal to act as if it were transparent. He believed that some tempering techniques created surface wrinkles on the mirror to make it translucent. Yet these wrinkles were imperceptible to the human eye. It turns out he was right. Many scientists tried to decipher the open mirrors over the centuries, but remained clueless. Finally, in 1932, William Bragg discovered that Shen Qiu had been right about imperceptible surface wrinkles all along. Every once in a while, people open multiple tabs in a browser and come to a point where there's no room for a new tab. Apparently, this had also been happening long before computers and the internet were invented. Meet the 16th century browser. This is a full-size book wheel. It's kind of a custom-made rotating bookshelf. 
Gregory Hayworth, a specialist in textual science, says that this tool has a system of epicyclic gears. That means that the book wheel has a working principle like a planetary system. One gear rotates around another. The shelves of the device maintain a constant 45-degree incline that holds the book securely as the giant wheel turns. Back then, people used the tool while writing encyclopedias and editions of classical works. In this kind of work, a person has to have many books open simultaneously so that the information from multiple sources can be gathered easily. Italian engineer Agostino Ramelli is the inventor of this piece of early modern machinery. What if I tell you that sponge divers in Greece accidentally found an ancient computer? They pulled out this artifact from a shipwreck near Antikythera Island in 1901. Scientists called it the Antikythera Mechanism and labeled it as the first mechanical computer. The machine looks like a hunk of bronze, but it has some kind of mechanism composed of gears and wheels. So, experts first assumed that it was an astronomer's tool. After an X-ray scan, though, they found out that the instrument was far more complex than they thought. The artifact was meant to calculate astronomical positions, track the four-year cycle of athletic games, and so on. It contained a box with dials on the outside and had an assembly of gear wheels attached. It's still unknown who built an instrument with this level of artistry 2,000 years ago and why this technology was lost. After seeing how sophisticated the device was, scientists accepted that their perception of ancient Greek engineering wasn't really accurate. Professor Michael Edmonds of Cardiff University admits that based on the knowledge they have, this mechanism shouldn't even exist. Edmund says the machine is one of a kind, and its astronomical calculations are precise. For him, the Antikythera mechanism is more valuable than the Mona Lisa. In 1929, scholars working in Topkapi Palace Museum in Turkey discovered a map. It became famous for being the oldest map showing the Americas. Perry Reese drew this detailed map on a gazelle skin in 1513. He depicted Europe, North Africa, the coast of Brazil, and several islands, such as the Azores and Canary Islands. The most exciting thing is that he created the map only 21 years after Columbus had set foot in the New World. Well, it was new to him. Perry Reese was a maritime scholar and a successful naval commander leading the Ottoman fleet. Yet, while drawing the map, he relied not only on his expertise in sailing, he created it by assembling and referring to 20 other regional maps, like the Arab map of India, four Portuguese maps, and the map of the western parts drawn by Columbus. Yes, the part he got from Columbus raised the heartbeat of many historians. Columbus drew a map during his third voyage to the New World and sent it to Spain in 1498. It's assumed to be lost. Surprisingly, historians can now understand what Columbus noted down by looking at Perry Reese's map. Fun fact, he also drew another world map in 1528. Even though only about one-sixth of this map has survived, it's clear that it described the northwestern part of the Atlantic, the region from Venezuela to Newfoundland, and the southern tip of Greenland. The map also showed Antarctica centuries before its discovery. Historians had to rethink the chronology of history after getting this crazy information. Perry Reese described Antarctica's topography without ice in great detail. Our sun is an average-sized star, and still, it could fit 1,300,000 Earths. The star is also 333,000 times as heavy as our planet. NASA has translated radio waves created by planets' atmospheres into audible sounds. That's how astronomers found out that Neptune sounds like ocean waves, Jupiter like being underwater, and Saturn's voice resembles background music to a horror movie. Here on Earth, it's bebop jazz. Now I made that up. The sun's surface is scorching hot, but a bolt of lightning is five times hotter. 
Earth gets struck by 100 lightning bolts every second, which results in 8 million lightning strikes a day and around 3 billion a year. Ooh, shocking! If you manage to go to the moon one day and see fresh footprints, that doesn't mean there's someone else there with you. Footprints or similar marks can last for a million years over there. Because the moon doesn't have an atmosphere. There are no winds, not even a breeze, that can slowly erase those footprints. Astronomers have found the largest hole we've ever seen in the universe. It's the giant void that spreads a billion light years across. They found it accidentally. One of the research team members was a little bored and wanted to check how things are going in the direction of the cold spot. That's an anomaly in the Cosmic Microwave Background Map, or CMB for short. It's a faint glow of light that falls on our planet from different directions and fills the universe. It's been streaming through space for almost 14 billion years as the afterglow that occurred after the Big Bang. So, you fall right into the heart of the black hole and prepare for a sad end. Well, you don't have to. Falling into a black hole won't necessarily destroy you or your spaceship. You have to choose a bigger black hole to survive. If you fall into a small black hole, its event horizon is too narrow, and the gravity increases every inch down. So, if you extend your arm forward, the gravity on your fingers is much stronger than on your elbow. This will make your hand lengthen, and you'll feel some… discomfort. Rather significant, to be honest. Things change if you fall into a supermassive black hole, like the ones in the center of galaxies. They can be millions of times heavier than the Sun. Their event horizon is wide, and the gravity doesn't change as quickly. So, the force you'll feel at your heels and at the top of your head will be about the same. And you can go all the way to the heart of the black hole. This myth is busted. If you watch a very touching movie in space and start crying, your tears won't run down. They will gather around the eyeballs. Your eyes will get too dry so you'll feel like they're burning. Any exposed liquid on your body will vaporize, including the surfaces of your tongue. Speaking of burning, that's one thing fire can't do in space. Fire can spread when there's a flow of oxygen. And since there's not any in space, well… Once they explode, stars aren't supposed to come back to life. But some of the stars somehow has survived the great supernova explosion. Such zombie stars are pretty rare. Scientists found a really big one called LP40-365. It's a partially burnt white dwarf. A white dwarf is a star that burned up all of the hydrogen, and that hydrogen was previously its nuclear fuel. In this case, the final explosion was maybe weaker than it usually is, not powerful enough to destroy the entire star. It's like a star wanted to explode but didn't make it, which is why part of the matter still survived. If you ever go into space, don't take off your spacesuit unless you're on a spaceship. Air in your lungs would expand, as well as the oxygen in the rest of your body. You'd be like a balloon, twice your regular size. Good news? The skin is elastic enough to hold you together, which means you wouldn't explode. <laughs> Small comfort. When something goes into a black hole, it changes shape and gets stretched out just like spaghetti. This happens because gravitational force is trying to stretch an object in one direction, but at the same time, squeeze it into another, like a pasta paradox. Speaking of, a black hole that's as big as a single atom has the mass of a really big mountain. There's one at the center of the Milky Way called Sagittarius A. It has a mass like for a billion suns, but luckily, it's far away from us. If you made a big boom on an asteroid, you'd never be able to hear its loud sound. Yes, we often hear the sound of spaceships and battles in space in the movies, but that's just a myth. Sound is a wave that spreads because of the vibrations of molecules. A person claps a few feet away from you, the sound wave begins to push the first air molecule next to the clap, then the second, third, and so on, until the wave reaches your ear. So, to spread sound, we need molecules like air or water. In our atmosphere, sound waves spread out just fine. But space is a vacuum, so it's nothing here. 
You can clap your hands loudly there, but there just won't be any molecules that can vibrate and carry that sound. So, to carry on a conversation, you'd either need a radio or really good lip-reading skills. Meteoroids orbit the sun, while the majority of human-made debris orbits our planet. For example, we launched almost 9,000 spacecraft around the world from satellites to rocket ships. Even the tiniest pieces can damage a spacecraft at such high speeds. Galaxies, planets, comets, asteroids, stars, space bodies are things we can actually see in space. But they make up less than 5% of the total universe. Dark matter, one of the biggest mysteries in space, is the name we use for all the mass in the universe that's still invisible to us. And there's a lot of it. It may even make 25% of the universe. Dark energy makes the other 70% of the universe. Hmm, that adds up to 100, right? That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.